Hi, I am Mari Almond. I am Sustainable Development Officer with the World Federation of the United Nations Association. Yeah, my name is Sunny Christopherson, and I'm uh, in the same field as the Hyper. Yeah. I'm Kieran Lettrick. I'm the Finance Administration Officer with the International Union. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Kira Lee. I'm also in Iris team. Hi, I'm Lubna. I'm a student at Columbia studying economic and political development, and I'm interning with IPP. And I'm uh, Carlos. I'm a consultant and on the uh, crisis team. Mm -hmm. Patrick Spearing from the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, working in public administration. Mm -hmm. I'm Chris Novi Troy from Governments and Peace Building here in the UNDP, focusing on the SDGs and those things. Super. Okay, but well, you know, before you start, you know your, you know. Uh, presentation. Let me just, you know, give you a few, you know, a few, a few remarks. Um, uh, this is a very informal conversation, you know, part of a, if I could say, a series of conversations that we want to bring, you know, to uh, to UNDP on interesting and I would say, you know, pioneering governance measurement uh, initiatives uh, that we know that we are aware of that speak to. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, and particularly Goal 16. Uh, two weeks ago, we had a very good discussion on the Bertelsmann Transformation Index. You know, in terms of, you know, what does it measure? You know, how does it fit into what uh, Goal 16 um, uh, is trying to do when it comes to governance issues in inclusive uh, societies? And um, th today, you know, we we had the pleasure to have Nathaniel Heller, Heller because you know Nathaniel has been working, you know, on. on a very interesting um, initiative that, that brings together all these different matrix uh, on governance and put them in one place, right, where you can you know, click, choose your country, and then it instantly gives you all the data on a, on a subset of, of governance uh, indicators um, in different uh, ranges. Why do we think that this is important? Uh, basically, now that countries have uh, approved you know, Agenda 2030, monitoring aspects will go into place and we see three different pillars or three different um, spheres of, of governance metrics. One is the, one of them is the official governance um, statistics. You know, the, the statistical commission will approve that it will say from the 169 targets of the 10 of the 16 goals, uh, these are the metrics you know, that, that every country will have to monitor the statistical commission. A second layer, uh, or you know, a second sphere, uh, is related to the international comparable indicators. Some of them, you know, have been already been identified in the indicator. We want a type of process through the virtual network that has identified some indicators that would be relevant to measure you know, the different targets. Uh, we think all 16, the Bertelsmann Transformation Index is one of them. The Worldwide Governance Indicator is another one. Global integrity is. Uh, uh, Budget transparency, um, the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, um, even you know the Social Progress Index that has all you know, things about political freedoms um, aspects. So that's the second type of you know categories of, of, of statistics, and this is in this second where I think that you know these uh, um, governance data alliance you know come into place because it has already done you know all the heavy lifting. Um, so to speak, all the network of pulling all that information um, centralized um, together. The third sphere, or you know, the third um, area is the national level. You know, the locally produced you know type of indicators or, or, or metrics that responds to the country's legislation on governance um, issues. Right? You know, every country produces you know, different type of of. of perception or experience-based uh, surveys uh, that speak about you know, their legislation. Some of those are done by the official <coughs> government channels, you know, the national statistical offices. Um, in others, the international community helps funding you know, uh, perception surveys or experience surveys, but also you know, the local academia, universities, civil society organizations that produce. Um, so when it comes to monitoring with uh, Goal 16, you know, all these three spheres or areas of governance metrics, you know, we need to be, you know, analyzed to understand what is, you know, the country's state of implementation on 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 the goal system, um, and 
you know, it, it's through analyzing these three levels that then it will help us to understand how countries, you know, what are the gaps in, in data, first of all, right, at the country level, not at the international level, but at the country level. And, you know, what are these specific recommendations? What are the things that are working at the country level when it comes to, to governance issues um, and when it comes to, you know, to goal 16 um, aspects? From the 10 targets within goal 16, some of them are easier to measure um, than others. And I think that we're all scratching our heads in terms of you know, how do we put numbers to, you know, uh, to some of those uh, um, targets. And, you know, part of this, you know, discussion, this exercise, is to brainstorm on how can we help also fill in, you know, bridge that gap of data or uh, information, um, so to speak. Um, so with that introduction, you know, I think that, you know, we are very happy, you know, to have Nathaniel, you know, to have, you know, agreed um, to come um, to UNDP on a very short notice, right? And uh, we apologize also for, for that because, you know, we have to take advantage of your transit through New York <laughs> from Washington, D.C. to Connecticut, you know, one, you know, long stopover in New York and, you know, come to, to, to UNDP. And, you know, just, you know, have a, you know, Nathaniel, a presentation of this, you know, uh, data governance uh, mm -hmm. alliance. What is it? Right? What are the different work streams that you have? And you know, with that small introduction that I just gave, you know, where do you think that you know, you, you know, that, you know we can make use mm -hmm. of that of that information or that tool, you know, that is being uh, made uh, available? Yeah. Um, we might have maybe you know one hour of conversation. I'll give you 15, 20 minutes, and then you know we, you know we open up you know for discussion. Um, I just want to have the <coughs> last chance to whoever I think that Gerardo is connected in Panama, just to make sure that uh, 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 we have people calling us uh, from the bridge. Uh, Gerardo, are you are you there? Thanks, everybody. A huge thanks to Jairo for organizing this. I think it was just sort of dumb luck that I happened to have to go to New Haven today anyway to Yale for a meeting. Um, so I just carved out an extra few hours that I appreciate you creating the, the time and space for this. Um, I, I hope it's really conversational. I'll try not to do a huge sort of dog and pony show presentation. Um, but it, it may help to set the stage a little bit just to talk about where this Governance Data Alliance came from. And in some ways, how it could or couldn't plug into uh, SGG monitoring and goal 16 and other goals. And it, it's a funny, interesting history, actually. We started the alliance a number of years ago with conversations around what we thought might uh, be what is now goal 16. And then we sort of pivoted very significantly for a number of years. And we may end up coming back to some of this in the next several months. Um, just a, a very brief um, amount of context about my own background professionally. Um, I cut my teeth, and this, this relates to these issues, I cut my teeth as working on essentially an investigative reporter and a public interest nonprofit, doing a lot of work on government accountability and transparency, spent a few years in government at the US State Department, and then um, co-founded and ran an NGO Global Integrity, which works on government transparency and anti-corruption issues globally uh, for just about a decade. Then I left uh, about a year and a half ago to go um, manage a bunch of portfolios that results for developments, which is another nonprofit that works in some ways on more traditional development agendas, particularly in health and education, doing a lot of um, technical assistance with governments on the ground and also a lot of work with donors to try and uh, promote more evidence-informed approaches to various um, development agendas. Um, there, I oversee a lot of social accountability and governance work, and I've also ended up inheriting a lot of work on WASH, on ag developments, uh, a bunch of our adaptive learning work, so I'm sort of learning on the fly on a bunch of new things. Um, what is now the Governance Data Alliance began um, with, I think, a similar amount of head scratching that Cairo described. Um, going back, from what I can recall, to spring of 2013, when within, and this was a time where we were still at Global Integrity, a number of us, at least at the international NGO level, were starting to both get excited about the possibility of what is now Goal 16, which we never had, of course, in the FDGs. And we thought that was great because it carved out a big political space for these agendas. And on the flip side, we sort of got to the same place pretty quickly, which is, wow, that'd be really exciting, but gosh, how would we possibly measure any of these things? And for a lot of the organizations that um, at that time and still now produce data around quote, governance issues, which of course is a big, messy, but interesting bucket of, of um, issues, 
we started literally just to kind of gather ourselves on conference lines and start to talk through should we care about what is now goal 16? If so, should we care about the measurement agenda? Should specifically, should we advocate for certain indicators and metrics and targets to be adopted or not? And what was, was interesting about that initial journey was that it ended up surfacing some some more, I would, I would argue, more interesting fundamental pain points and issues that were sort of simmering and bubbling under the surface amongst a number of these organizations. This included places like Transparency International, the National Budget Partnership, National Resource Governance Institute, lot, and so on and so on. There were probably a dozen different organizations in these calls. And it turns out there was a lot of pain and suffering that uh, that is associated and was associated with producing the data that they all put out, and yet no one really talked about it. And so a lot of these calls ended up turning into kind of group therapy sessions where we would sort of it was a safe space amongst <coughs> peers to sort of voice the concern, the angst, the frustration, the difficulty of doing this kind of raw, you know, primary data collection on these very fuzzy but very important topics, the huge costs involved with doing this kind of data collection, which as many of you know are still very significant. Um, and it turned out we all were sort of suffering in silence, I think, um, and in isolation, and it, it did sort of become this group therapy session. Out of that therapy, um, were born a couple of different ideas. One of I think the core that really started to drive what is now the Governance Data Alliance was, gee, there's a lot of inefficiency and uh, excess effort that we are currently expending as a community to produce these data. What if we came together a bit in a semi-coordinated fashion? Would that help to basically drive down the pain, suffering, and unit cost associated with producing these data? And that was, I think, the fundamental insight behind the Alliance was, yes, all these organizations that are currently in and expanded membership will be in the Alliance produce very different data and no one's changing what they're doing but the mechanics that are involved in producing and publishing and analyzing those data are often quite similar so that led to a series of brainstorms around how we can do some of this in a coordinated fashion that might drive down some of the costs and the effort that's required um, that ended up um, bubbling up into a big two-day design session I think it was in spring maybe April of 2014 in Washington where we had a bunch of the same big NGOs in the room. We also started to bring in governments, particularly from the global south. And, and the reality, of course, is that whether they like it or not, these governments are forced to, often forced to respond to these data because they're explicitly or implicitly tied to aid flows in many ways. Um, also in the room were sort of new generation donors like the Millennium Challenge Corporation, uh, which as you know, you know, directly ties very large aid packages to a lot of these data in a very transparent way. And so we started to have really interesting conversations with, with users of these data, whether they were uh, willing users or grudging users about their challenges in digesting these data, their challenges in thinking through policy reforms and interventions that might improve performance on these data sets. Uh, also in the room were a lot of donors who were spending a lot of money over many, many years to fund these data exercises. And what came out of that big design workshop was basically a vision for what you now see today, which is less about a website, although the website was sort of an accidental byproduct along the way of this journey. Uh, and it was more about this collaborative effort. And we talk and use still today this metaphor of marketplace for these data to really describe what I think we're collectively after, which is uh, trying to sort of at least aspire for a reality in which uh, users of governance data can somehow signal to producers what they want, what they're incented to use, what would be more useful for policy processing, for advocacy, for a range of other use cases, and have producers actually produce those data instead of the current state of play, even today, I would argue, which is producers produce things either with a very shaky sort of aspirational theory of change, which suggests somebody out there in the world is going to use it, sort of build it, and they will come, and or it's just donor driven, which is somebody wakes up and decides we need an index or a data set on. Just fill in a blank, you can find out almost anything today is willing to cut a check for that and we produce it and again it's a sort of build it and they will come. And if you look at the real impact and uptake of so many of these data, even if they're of good quality and well produced, they're very, very poor. And that was one of I think one of the other core experiences and shared pain points from the early discussions was you know, you, we started to unearth and <coughs> realize that no one really amongst the community of producers in particular had any really good sense of who was using the data. I mean, the best you could come up with was you'd run into someone you know, at a meeting, at a conference, you'd get a call from a government or an embassy saying, you know, could you come brief us, could you walk us through? You know, that was about the best anybody could, could offer, which is not you know, terrible, but that seemed pretty deeply insufficient when we looked at the return on investments we were trying to get out of these exercises, and frankly, the financial investments that were being made to produce these data. Um, it, 
you know, in a functioning marketplace, data that were not terribly useful or influential or impactful would be essentially eviscerated by the market, right? Nobody would use them, nobody would want your stuff, nobody would pay for your stuff, you would go away and die. Here, you have a lot of zombie exercises that persist, or at least exercises that are well-intentioned but aren't targeting real you know, use cases, and yet they persist for a host of, you know, sort of uh, bizarre reasons that are, you know, unfortunate errors in the development space. So, we had this, you know, big visioning exercise and sort of workshops, and what emerged, you know, is now the governance data lines. And as Laura said, it's structured essentially around four, four work streams. The first um, is essentially producer to producer peer learning, uh, for lack of a better cliche. And what that really is is a set of essentially no cost exercises that the, pr the data producers in the alliance um, lead themselves to try and surface and tackle common challenges around the nuts and bolts of producing these kinds of data. And that's a lot of jargon to say it's, you know, we'll spend two or three hours gathering folks virtually and in person to talk about, you know, how do you do, and what are good uh, and poor ideas for data visualization? How do you deal with data storage and security? How do you manage research teams remotely? How do you deal with data collection platforms? Very, very boring but important operational elements that actually uh, involve huge costs uh, themselves or cost savings when done well. Uh, and again, the methodologies that are used to drive a lot of these data sets are quite similar. And so when you start to talk about, gee, you know, I found this clever way of recruiting great people in you know, Southern Africa, here's a great list to go to. Like That's quite revolutionary and quite you know, powerful for a lot of organizations. Um, the second work stream, which I think is actually the most fascinating and potentially transformative, is a huge amount of work we're doing around understanding governance data users, uh, who they actually are in the world, why they use these data or not, and what they use them for. And that sounds, again, fairly commonsensical if we were in a functional marketplace, but in the current state of play, we aren't. And so, as I described earlier, there isn't you know, a very good sense of who data users are. The first big step for the Alliance to explore the data user terrain uh, was to commission a huge piece of research, essentially a data mining exercise from Aid Data down to College of William & Mary, uh, which some of you may be familiar, to take, uh, to sort of mine a slice of their omnibus uh, survey called the Reform Effort Survey, which is essentially a large end survey of, of officials in low and middle income country governments, as well as eight officials in those same countries, and journalists and CSOs sprinkled in, that asks about <coughs> the awareness and salience and use of third party assessments and ratings, um, which include a lot of the data sets that are in the governance data alliance. And so we commissioned them to go out and sort of do a big data mining exercise of just the slice of respondents who were familiar with some of these data sets, and to actually understand and describe where they sit inside the public sector, where they use, how, and if and when they use these data or not. Um, and what, it was really, really revealing. So we published a paper, which is on this website, on the Data's website in February, and there's some very counterintuitive findings. Things like, um, it turns out that NGOs and journalists are among the weakest users of these data, when in fact all of us thought they were always the power users. And it turns out that actually, you know, very senior level government officials up to heads of state and government are on average more familiar with these data than mid-level technocrats. Again, very counterintuitive. Um, and there are some interesting potential theories for why we see some of those results. So we got all this rich sort of analytical work from made data, and we're going to start to now use this existing sample frame that they've built to field snap <laughs> polls um, in the coming months, actually over the summer go out and ask this huge set of respondents some very simple questions about some of these very practical issues that these groups are working on, especially the data producers. You know, for example, would you find it really compelling if you know, we built a fancy, essentially $100,000 data visualization platform on the web, or would you just want a CSV file of the data? Which could have huge ramifications for how these groups choose to invest or not um, in various user-facing tools uh, and uptake strategies. So that's, that's this whole user feedback <coughs> work stream. The third work stream essentially is this one-time lift that is to build governancedata.org, which we can surf around here if people are interested. Um, in some ways, this was not part of the original plan, to be honest, but people like websites. Um, <laughs> and it was also, I think, increasingly clear that if we just made a little bit of a push, we could bring in so much of the data that was already out there in the world in a way that was somewhat comparable and more user-friendly. And so that's what we've done here. I'll, I'll get through a couple of points, then we can if it's useful to play around with the website. Then the fourth work stream, which is the one we haven't actually started yet, is that we're still trying to, frankly, fundraise for it, is a set of um, experiments to do coordinated field work um, amongst at least several data producers in some sort of small number of contiguous countries in the world, probably an undercovered region like the Caribbean, the Gulf, uh, the South Pacific, other places where there just aren't a lot of governance data, to see if by working together in a coordinated fashion we can drive down the unit costs and time associated typically with trying to produce these data. Um, 
So you can envision a scenario in which you have maybe six to eight or upwards of ten data producers who decide in a certain window of time to go into the same, say, four or five, six countries, produce the data using their existing methodologies, but to do it in a way that tries to share resources, whether it's shared research teams on the ground, shared data quality teams on the back end, shared technology platforms, all the major drivers of cost that we know tend to creep into these exercises. We want to see if you know we can measure quantitatively a decrease in unit cost or not. If not, then we know it's, there's no point scaling that kind of exercise up. If it does decrease the unit cost, if we can achieve some economies of scale, there's a certain hope that you know, that could become a model, or sort of, you know, a way to model how to do this kind of data production in the future. Not to say we need one omnibus, you know, silver bullet data set in the future, but that there are huge potential economies of scale to be achieved by doing it in a semi-coordinated fashion. So that's the fourth work stream. Um, I failed to mention a kind of obvious thing, like who's in the alliance. I should do. It's on the website and it's sort of ever growing. We're in a big recruiting push. But right now it includes, yeah, maybe if you bring in Okada or Okada or about, yeah. Um, uh, a lot of the big international NGOs that produce a lot of governance data, so Transparency International, Global Integrity, International Budget Partnership, National Resource Governance Institute, World Resources Institute, World Justice Project. We won't read them all up. A lot of those great groups. Uh, a number of governments, although small, hopefully growing, who again are sort of power users of a lot of these data. Some of these are frankly governments that in the past have worked very closely with certain donors to try and design policy reform programs around some of these data. Um, and then a number of multilaterals and others, including I think important the World Bank, OECD, um, so OECD's governance at a glance work, the banks doing business team, and a range of the projects that swirl around doing business um, are in the alliance. And then you've got a couple of philanthropic donors that have invested heavily, particularly in some of the NGO data production, so the Field Foundation, the Madeira Network, and others. Um, as I mentioned, we are in a big sort of recruiting push um, by design, so it's very likely you'll see groups like uh, the World Wide Web Foundation and Open Knowledge Foundation come in very soon. They produce some of the best assessments of open data uh, and related uh, sort of open data exercises. Uh, Burgles in, and I think we don't even talk to them, it's very likely they would come in. Um, and also the barometer, so Latino barometer, Afro barometer, all the good barometer exercises who do produce really, you know, very powerful and, and, uh, and helpful household survey work, you know, we'll hope to bring in as well. And there's a range, there's a constellation of others. The truth is we've been trying to not swallow so many at once that it's sort of clear. Uh, the very, very little secretary for this thing is essentially housed at where I work, results of the <coughs> which is, you know, about a body's worth of people. Uh, so we're sort of somewhat conservative in doing too much on a monthly basis to avoid overloading the system. Um, so recruitment's a big push for us. And then secondly, in terms of where the alliance is headed, and this, you know, is maybe where I'll stop and we can lead back to goal 16. Everything I just rambled on about in some ways was a, a, sub, a, de, a departure from the original inspiration behind the conversations in 2013, which was now goal, which is now goal 16. But I think the alliance is likely to sort of pivot back just in some ways because we can't avoid you know, being looped into these conversations. It's a very natural fit whether we want to or not. Um, I think the groups and the, the, the alliance organizations themselves already, many of them already play a key role in both the policy work and the advocacy work around what is now Goal 16, so it's a very natural fit sort of intellectually and emotionally. Uh, governancedata.org and those dashboards, they provide it, I don't think they're an answer to how to track Goal 16 right now, but they provide an interesting way to think about not just data visualization and presentation, but this whole idea of a mosaic of data, to me being a far more compelling way of understanding country progress rather than looking for silver bullet indicators. And I, that's, I mean, that's, that's could be an interesting departure for discussion. Having spent, sadly, far too much of my career worrying about governance data, it, I, I think it's fair to say none of us, even with unlimited resources and time and mandate, will be able to craft a sort of perfect set of metrics um, that are universally, powerfully applicable to every single country context. I think, to me, a more powerful counter argument or a different approach is let's just gather as much solid good data that's out there. It may not be a you know, available for all countries, but when you step back and look in a country across 15, 20, 30, 50 metrics around a basket of governance issues, and you start to sort of see you know, red, green, yellow light up in different ways, you get a pretty good gut sense in a given year for sort of what the trend lines are. Is this a country that's sort of on the upward path? Is it stagnated? Is it, is it heading, you know, unfortunately, in a backsliding uh, fashion? To me, something like that is a little bit more, in some ways, both intuitive and <laughs> achievable in the short, medium term. So I think you will start to see the alliance, per se, and its member organizations either remain or become increasingly engaged in Goal 16 discussions. 
And then secondly, there's a whole sw swirling set of discussions, as I'm sure many of you know, participating around the, sort of the data revolution, quotes, global partnership for sustainable development data and related initiatives. And I think there as well, the alliance will probably end up uh, plugging in a little bit more, um, trying to model what these kind of data collaboratives, I think is what GPSDD terminology uh, is, look, could look like. You know, here's a, a very, or in some ways, an organic um, collaborative of organizations, both producers and users, that came together around a particular slice of data, development data, in this case, governance data. And that could be an interesting one to look at for maternal health, for secondary education, for you know, hygiene. You, know, you could see these sorts of collaboratives potentially emerging, but you know, I think the power of the Governance Data Alliance has always been, uh, it was demand-driven and very organic. It was not a you know, donor-driven process, but I mean, we did, did need money at some point, but we sort of had a kind of idea and went out and found it instead of it just being forced upon us. And I think that's commonsensical, but also an important takeaway, at least from this ongoing experience, has been we did it because there was a lot of <coughs> pain and we were trying to solve that pain. It wasn't because you know, somebody decided we should all do this and sort of start a check to, to help us do it. Um, so I think that may be a reasonable place to wrap up. Again, we can play with the website. I'll just pull up the data, some of the data pages. Sorry for those who are virtual and hard to see. If you go to governancedata.org, you get the same idea. And again, play with this on here. Uh, so we can look at, you know, for a given country, existing data for a given year. You start, you know, we do some color, arbitrary color coding to try and triage results into like happy, mediocre, sad sorts of news. <laughs> it's very arbitrary. It's a whole lengthy ex explanation for why it's arbitrary. Um, yeah, so if you look, go back in time and look, just randomly choosing that area here. Um, what you see also from the dashboards is the, the lack of data, right? The data gaps, which is another interesting, important byproduct of some of, this, some of these features on the website is to drive home this, fact, this idea, which is true, that we really are still lacking data. It's a pretty serious one. Also, that's high that the government wants to just see the data that's available. Um, so that's, you know, there's a way to look at it at a country level. You can get a little bit more detail if you go to this list view for a country. It's sort of nice just to look at medium, you know, peers in the income cohort and regional peers. And then also, um, at a data set level, you can say, show me current resources, new environmental democracy index, current, you know, previous years, and just look at the rank order and sift them and sort them and that sort of stuff, which is always helpful in some ways. And I think what's gotten a lot of traction is, is but this comparison tool, we can choose countries and years. So let's I'll just be arbitrary here. Choose three countries. Uh, let's see. And then you can even fiddle with you know, different years, which is not terribly kosher methodologically, but it's sort of sometimes interesting. And just again, all it is is a big right, set of tables behind the scenes, but just be able to filter it, display it, print it out, and share it. Actually, really useful. <laughs> so I think for this website, the power users thus far are often a lot of the groups whose data are in here because now they can sort of do these quick gut checks of like, are we wild the diversion from our peers or not? And if so, not that it's wrong, but like, what, is, what story is that telling? And just really, really kind of rich stuff that comes out of this. Um, you know, to be able to just get a, a unique link and share it on social media, share it in an email, embed it as a chart. Again, seems simple and mundane, but it's not. I think it's been actually really powerful. Also, the ability to download these raw data, all of this data is open. You can download every single data point on the Alliance website. But you know, the ability to just get, and it's about a split second, a uh, structured CSV file with standardized headers. Again, seems really nerdy and mundane, but it's really, really massive time saver for a lot of groups. Um, so that's a big feature as well. So that's, that is a quick tour of the website. But again, hopefully self explanatory Thank you. Thank sure. You. Quick, quick uh, question before you know we open uh, up the round. All, the, all the, the members of the alliance, you know, is there any criteria like you know, if you have a, you need to have at least you know X number of countries, you know, in your data set. What's the question? Be included or you know, can it be in country specific? That's a very good question. I, right now, we're sort of hardwired to gravitate towards this is for data producers for that cohort, producers that are producing. Uh, some amount of data that covers multiple countries rather than a single country diagnosis, let's say. Okay. But I think that's that's something we need to fix in the future. It's just this was kind of our first expansion push. That all said, you'll see producers in here that only produce data for maybe 30, 40 countries. Um, 
in the future, maybe even less, but probably more than one. <laughs> yeah. Because so much of what we've done with this particular website is sort of looking from country to country. Um, but it doesn't, you know, I don't think any producer on the flip side has, covers more than 100, 120 countries, <laughs> except for maybe some of TI's large end survey work, which, because it's Gallup, it touches maybe 150 plus in a given year. But most of these are probably in the 30 to 100 country range, which again speaks to some of the huge problem, you know, challenges we all have in the future. You know, like you go to films, I mean, a, Total integrity happened when I was there. We happened to do some crazy, insanely difficult work in the South Pacific for a couple of years. And you know, before we would start that field work, you'd go and look around for like what data is out there for Solomon Islands, for Vanuatu, for Tonga. Like there's nothing, like basically nothing. And I mean, that's a big problem. So for 100 countries in the world, we collectively as a community have some fairly rich data, even though it's patchy. The next 100 is kind of a disaster. You know, maybe you've got some 2007 thing that somebody did, which is already nearly a decade out of date. Maybe you've got a random survey from last year. I mean, it's just, it's a really bad situation. I think that's a big collective action problem that you know, we probably want to solve is, you know, what do you do with that 40% of the world where there's just no data, almost no data. And um, two other questions, and then, you know, I promise that I will open up the <coughs> conversation, because, uh, you know, I think that from, from, from all the indicators that you have, there, mm -hmm. and looking at the 10 targets within Goal 16, and the different indicators, yeah. What, which ones do you think are most relevant right, for that for that process? And related to that, how and data like this can help in the monitoring at a global level of 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 right. So flipping this up to find a cheat sheet of all the targets. Um, trying to think of a sort of concise way to reflect on that. The, I mean, some of the goal, I mean, goal 16, as we all know, is sort of a cats and dogs. It's a good goal, there's a lot of cats and dogs in there. Oh, thank you. You know, this is my heart. Yeah. <laughs> um, right now, in the governance data lines, you won't find a lot of groups, in, potentially in the future, as we expect, but you won't find a lot who are going to touch 16.1, 16.2, and. You know, 16B is kind of fuzzy in terms of the alliance. The others, you're going to find data sets that you could at least make a semi-plausible argument would be reasonable proxies or measures of some of these targets. All the rule of law stuff, all the corruption stuff, the illicit flow stuff. So global financial integrity is in the alliance. Of course, they do some of the work on illicit flows around the world. TI is in there. I mean, the ones that are just really, really hard, right? 16.6 is like no one knows what to do with it, right? Like we all know it's super important in our heads. We can describe it, but yeah. It's, it's like a whole, it's a PhD thesis waiting to be written just to even unpack how you would get a measurement around 16.6. Could you take some alliance or, you know, data and sort of stitch it together possibly? Would, I, would it be good enough? I would think of not. I mean, the OECD and the bank have been trying this effective institutions platform thing for like, I don't know, five years. It's basically gone nowhere. It's half stillborn at this point. I mean, people have tried. Just to take that example of 16.6, try to get at and unpack what are effective institutions. I mean, it's just really subjective, really fuzzy, and I don't think there's a globally agreed consensus or a norm around what that looks like. What are institutions? I mean, it's just it's tricky. <laughs> um, so I think some of these, that also, I think the corruption one, the illicit flows, the bribery stuff, um, participation and access to information, those are more naturally accessible in the immediate term to just grab the existing data, whether they're from the Alliance or elsewhere. So maybe half of goal 16 overall, and I think that's kind of where we all are as a community. You could sort of get to a comfortable place trying to measure with some existing data. The others, I'm not, I mean, I think it's, it's a project. Not a project. It's, it's going to take up some work to get there. Okay. Good. Maybe we open up you know, if you have any other questions. Otherwise, I keep asking questions. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Nathaniel. Really sure. interesting and great to have some of those phrases and concepts that we're all kind of vaguely familiar with all down to the table and to understand a bit more about the alliance. Because as you say, there's many, many partnerships yeah. and many groups that are active in this space. Uh, and we're keen on it from UNDP side to make sure that we're helping mm -hmm. to facilitate and you know, encourage dialogue and collaboration where yeah. we can. So it was fantastic to have that insight. I mean, I suppose the, the overarching question is not necessarily for immediate answer, because I don't think it's, it's one that, that has a, a short answer. But you mentioned that goal 16 is different because of the political <laughs> commitment. And in a sense, what's coming together and what you've just said about the, the difficulties of ch 
challenges with measuring goal 16, you now have that space around which member states and other sorts of producers will come together in a way that they never have before. Yeah. Um, and there's something that, you know, in meetings with Marie and, and others internally as well, you know, how do you get that trust building between users and producers inside and outside government? Because at the moment around the kind of global indicator set, there's that kind of knee jerk, if it doesn't come from the National Statistical Office, we're not going to recognize it. Yep. And how do we make sure that we know the data? <laughs> so is there something, and again, just initial reflections, because it's something we probably need to keep going back to over a period of lots of years, but is, is there something about how we can work first at the global level, because that's where the focus has been, but also in your experience at the national level, you know, what is it that brings people together around and what's encouraged member states to come to the Global Alliance, for example, and how we start with them? Yeah, I mean, as you hinted at, I don't think I have a silver bullet answer. I, I do think part of this is is modeling a different approach. I mean, this we're never going to do well on goals, tracking goal 16 it's, if the dogma of just it has to be added so data is the only path, right? It's, there's just, there's no, there's no good, hardly any or no good data from NSOs in most countries, including OECD countries on most of these issues. So if we're realistic, if you set, set aside the neurology, you're realistic about how, where is the data even today? It's largely going to be from outside of national statistical offices. Um, so to me, I mean, some of the work you've done here with, I mean, where I would go if I had unlimited, you know, mandate and resources would be to, to pick some sort of positive deviance who, inside of NSOs and the public sector who are naturally inclined towards more of a partnership with non-governmental data producers. There could be private sector, labor unions, but it doesn't have to be NGOs in the classic sense. Um, and to start to work to you know, operationalize what it would mean at a domestic level to track Goal 16 in a comprehensive way, drawing in both domestic and international data sources, and to sort of model a way and show that it's safe, it's not scary, it doesn't undermine the authority of NSOs, it may have frankly even bolster their resources and may bring in additional funding for their work. Uh, to me that's not a, a brilliant answer, but I think that's the, the most powerful way of doing it. To not try to, first of all, not trying to global scale what we did initially, but to pick, you know, five or six, whatever, ten. And so, you know, we kind of know where these, these, these smart and good folks are and to start to build, I mean, maybe it's using things like global partnership to say, well, the data you prefer create the political space, but then sort of hyper-localize it very quickly and to show what it could mean to sort of really support you know, a governance data ecosystem, let's say, which could draw on NSO data, could draw on NGO data, could draw on private sector data, big data, and digital data exhaust, whatever, um, and to try and really sort of live that for a period of time and to see how we can produce and map out some of these data against the targets. You know, and if it doesn't work, then that's good. We haven't wasted you know, $50 million doing it. If it does work, it could be a very powerful sort of way to demonstrate to others that it is you know, it may be complex, but it's not a scary and a threatening thing to do. Um, and it's not all on the NSOs to figure this out because they won't be able to it's in so many countries. Really. That, that, that'd be a gut, sort of gut instinct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I actually have comments that are related to the ones that you made. You call it a knee jerk reaction, actually. Others might call it a skepticism, healthy skepticism, data that doesn't come from, from uh, recognized uh, sources, uh, internationally recognized sources. So uh, a couple of points or questions. One, one question is, uh, who's eligible to be in the alliance? Is there some kind of accreditation procedure? Who decides? Right. Uh, and then, uh, is there any mechanism for uh, assessing the quality of the data that's coming out of the alliance? Uh, some kind of independent review mechanism, for example, of world mm -hmm. Um If there is, that would be actually very strong uh, and uh, might lead to improved use of the data from these various entities. Right. The international actors, and then related to that is, uh, you know, is it, is it possible to publish some of this information on how the data is used? Both is right. We've simply done this in right. some study, found some surprising results. We can demonstrate that this some of these data sets are found to have legitimacy for very important reasons, and mm -hmm. then find as much as we can. Yeah, those are great, great thoughts. Um, to take them quickly, eligibility is, is a very, very streamlined process. I think it's, it's about a five minute web form, which is somewhere on the Alliance's <laughs> website. And then there's a, there's a there, I forgot, I failed to mention, there is a steering committee for the Alliance, which is not me, it's, it's a bunch of the, it's nine uh, steering committee members, largely drawn from all the groups in the Alliance, I think entirely drawn from those members. Um, and there's the, and 
derived from that membership committee who just looks at these things. I mean, right now, there's so much low-hanging fruit to pull off the tree that we kind of know who's great and who we still can bring in. I think, you know, a year or two from now, it'll be interesting when there's some unexpected producers or users who want to come into the alliance that we aren't as familiar with. Yeah, we'll do a little bit more vetting, but for now, it's a very lightweight. Frank, we're proactively recruiting people in right now. I think the more interesting bit will be for that membership committee, what happens when someone off the street who seemingly is doing some work around this area, but who's less familiar to the community, um, knocks on the door. And I think it's purely just a question of talking to them and learning more about the work. I, I think the bias is to have a really, really big tent. So it's, I would think, not impossible, but unlikely, we would say absolutely no, to whether it's governments, data producers, you know, users. Uh, it's really, I think the only thing we care about is screening out essentially crazy people so we're not wasting time dealing with crazies. Um, that's sort of the low bar we've set for ourselves. Um, so that's sort of how to get how it gets in. Um, there is no check or sort of blessing of the lines data at this point. I think that's, I frankly, we've not discussed that, but I think that's really interesting. So I'll certainly take that back as a future looking um, idea for the alliance to consider is do we want some imprimatur of correct this uh, from some internationally recognized body that would maybe stimulate greater use. I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, so I currently know we just sort of say we, we rest on the quality of our you know, individual reputations. And yeah, all the groups here are exceptionally transparent with their methodologies and their processes, so it's, there's no black box you know, data sets that are in here. But that's a really interesting, powerful point that we haven't really talked about too much. Um, and in the work that I mentioned earlier, this initial um, data analysis work. He's both linked to somewhere on the Alliance website, I think in the blog, and also Aid Data itself put it out in a pretty huge way. So it's out there, but um, you know, I think that's a good point that I'll certainly take back because maybe we, do, we need to mind even that record and sort of make a bigger deal of where these data have been used, you know, especially at senior levels by unexpected actors, um, which is actually quite true when you start to look through the results and find really interesting anecdotes. And also just interesting trend lines, um, again, that are both counterintuitive and also potentially powerful and motivating folks to take some of these data more seriously. I want to give the opportunity to people outside of the room uh, that are connected through the bridge if they want to ask any questions or want to intervene. Please uh, do so. <coughs> if not, no, no. I can, I, you know, I, we, we can hear people on the other side, right? Uh, we cannot get the integrity of their conversation, but we know that there's people on the other side. Uh, so if you want to intervene and you know ask a question to Natania or you know, to the group, you know, please feel free uh, to jump up anytime. Otherwise, you know, anybody else in the room that would like to ask uh, a question, Natania, this high-level political force. You know, member states will need to come to New York and you know to report on what they are doing and all these different. You know, aspects and you know, clearly you know you know what you are doing you know will help us you know to centralize you know to, to make it easier for you know, to use and so there's always this political dimension right you know, you know you know who's the owner of this data you know to, you know uh, uh, any a, any discussion in, in in terms of you know having um, you know you know if we can call it like shadow reports you know that you know that can be submitted you know or prepared you know out of these all these data yeah. that speak specifically to you know, the, you know, the, you know the different targets you know with the goal 16. Uh, what would be yeah. your your thoughts in terms of how this can then be used you know as, as you know, we move forward in that in, within that process because i think it's, yeah. it's it's very clear what the what the what the data alliance does right and it's very clear in terms of what's the data that is collecting and you know the usefulness uh, but then it's like, okay how do you feed into the Policy, you know, international decision making yeah. uh, processes. No, you, no it's, it's amazing timing for that question. The last few days, there's been a lot of action around that HLPF and shadow monitoring, precisely. So maybe you have inside intel. Um, so I think, I mean, I think it's fair to say and share that there's a pretty reasonable chance we're gonna we're gonna try to work we the alliance with <coughs> a number of NGOs. That, Sure. Some of them are at the table and others uh, who care a whole lot about Goal 16 do a lot of advocacy around it to try and basically repurpose and recycle a lot of not just the, the online tools but the, the data schema and the, the core approach to what we've done with the data lines for Goal 16 shadow monitoring. So 
you sort of close your eyes and imagine both literally and figuratively this website and this effort, and you just take out all the data sets and you bring in a bunch of, some actually a few would stay, you bring in a bunch of other data sets that match up against you know, other stuff that we don't have, so you know, trafficking, violent deaths, et cetera, and sort of do the same thing in time for the HLPF to do some shadow monitoring that I think is a non-crazy potential outcome in time for July. So we're sort of trying to get to a spread of the um, And it's for exactly those reasons. Uh, it's one, not actually technically super difficult, but there's a, I think there's a strong desire on several fronts to avoid recruiting wheels. And so if we can take this and re, you know, sort of take the guts out of it and stick in a bunch of additional data that tracks and matches up more closely with many, if not all, the targets, then why not? You know, just say here's at least the best, you know, current available proxies that we could grab from around the world that are, you know, gen generally respected and understood to be quality data. Maybe they're not the IEG data that they are, but to say like here's here's what this community thinks could be useful proxies as a shadow monitoring technique. So I think that's there's a pretty good chance that'll happen. So maybe, you know, part is just going to be can we get it done in time, but. So certainly a lot of discussion. Just as a comment on shadow versus um, state reporting, I mean, what would be great, again, going back to that original question, is how to encourage uh, more confidence um, in what it is that, that's being presented. <coughs> and how do we get that in some way into a, a kind of combined approach? Uh, there will be a, an NGO watchdog function. Energy that's going into preparing ways of collecting data and generating what's now available um, could be made official use of in some way over time. Mm -hmm. So it's seen as a collaborative effort uh, yeah. rather than a, a, a kind of split. Uh, but again, I don't want to come across as No, but I think it, you know, it's, it'd be hard to do that in 100 countries today, but I think there's, you know, there are several, if not a, you know, multiple dozen, yeah. where you know, as a community, if we just sort of press the button a few times, you'll get a lot of receptiveness from national stats offices, from others that care about this. Um, and understand that this vertical linkage of these very global processes and architectures down to the very domestic um, data collection and data usage uh, you know, scenarios is very powerful, actually. But it's often not being done. So all the SDG tracking, which is kind of up here in the clouds, may may not have any utility for policymakers, decision makers, and actors. At the national level, never mind the subnational. I mean, I think it's fair to say it's just useless. Not in a dark sense, it's just not useful. Um, so that's, I think, is incredibly rich and exciting. But how do you, you know, work with a mayor, a governor, um, you know, local communities in a region of a country, farmer co-ops, who are gathering and actually using large amounts of data who also have huge data needs and thirsts. And that's not going to be satisfied by stuff we do here, right? And, but it's not super rocket science and expensive to think about how to bridge the gap vertically. I think that's largely unexplored, and I think we're super excited. We're like you know the separate work I'm doing at R4D, for example, in ag, just to take a random sector. Yeah. Um, that there, there's incredibly ripe opportunities for doing that, where you can get from elite global monitoring and tracking straight down to like the, the small hold of farmer level. Um, and I just think it's there's just so much that can be done across the SCU. Certainly, goals have seen across. You know, yeah, particularly with the participatory inclusive um, mm -hmm. yeah. approach. You got I mean, remote sensing and biophysical data that's come online in recent. It was just a whole host yeah. of opportunities that were never there before. Um, you still have to do some of this grunt work to <laughs> gather data on some of these issues, but we start to you know think really ambitiously about how you bring big data, how you bring biophysical and remote sensing. You know, so we did it. It's not. Not simple, but it's also not nearly as impossible as we thought five years ago. Any more questions? I'm sure that we have some. I don't want to look into people, but you know, gender issues, you know, that comes, you know, to mind. That's so, you know, how do we, you know, is it, is it possible to start this aggregating from what more than you currently exist in these in these um, databases for gender issues? Yeah, most of these data sets that are currently in the alliance are not at all gender sensitive, nor are they pro core to use two you know, turns of phrase well like. And so that's a problem, or at least it's a big opportunity. <laughs> right how you look at it. Um, and I think for a lot of these groups, a lot, at least the data producers in the alliance, there's a, there is a real interest in, again, sort of receiving signals from the market, so to speak, of 
what people would find more impactful and would generate more traction and usage. So basically, there's enough clamor to say, you know, we really, you know, we data users really want to see gender disaggregated data on budget transparency or something. Yeah, I think you'd see a really interesting, genuine discussion within an IDP to try and reimagine how they gather data around the open budget index or whatever. It's just a you know, hypothetical. Um, so part of it is trying to get this marketplace working, the signaling working, so we're getting data producers. Um, number one, understand who they are, and then number two, you're trying to do some of this polling and conversations um, just to understand. Maybe it's just that maybe we're the only people that care about gender disaggregated data, who knows? Um, but if we're not, and there's a real demand and thirst for that, then that, needs to, that signal needs to make us go back to producers. And the incentives, of course, have to be there as well, whether financial or otherwise. Um, yeah, so I think there's huge potential. To me, it's more of an opportunity than a challenge, but it's very fair to say currently the vast majority of these data sets, except for some of the survey-based work here, which would be some of the Gallup poll that TI does and some of the other survey work, World Justice Project survey work, those are just outliers. The rest of them are largely gender blind, which is, I think, because they were born 10, 15 years ago when those agendas just weren't as prominent. I mean, even when we you know, started the Global Integrity Index and a lot of our subnational work 10, 12, 15 years ago, it was, these were just, I mean, we didn't even think about this stuff, which is not good, it's just the reality, you know, just to think about it. Is the prior group part of your universe in some way? Will it be? I think it's the latter. I think we've said to ourselves collectively, we do need to spend more time watching, supporting, plugging into the prior group, <laughs> but not yet. <laughs> okay. So that's another one I should have included in the bucket of Vanguard things yeah. that are coming. I think that's another yeah. natural entry point. I, I think they'd be um, delighted to have that uh, contact. Yeah. Yeah. And the um, specific reference you made to the user um, analysis. Uh, yeah. they've, they've been doing a, a survey with NSOs. Oh, that's right. right. Yeah. And so it's great to, to um, help us and take that. Yeah. And if it's not one that you've already got, um, I need to uh, cable in. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, help, uh, yeah. help I know some some of the groups do, but that may not hurt to just sort of yeah. read both. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Just try to give the opportunity one more time to the, the people yeah. outside of the room. Good chat. Right? <laughs> you know, we just heard you know some little noise you know happening around. Uh, so if anybody on the other side of the bridge you know wants to you know uh, participate, uh, it's you know you know how does it say you know speak now or <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> or, or me. <laughs> Is it around? Uh, Yes, we have somebody from Johannesburg. We just heard you. Yeah, Mark walking. Hello. Mark, can you go ahead, please? You have a question. No, uh, Mark, firstly, to thank you for uh, making the event accessible by telephone. Uh, that's uh, a, a wonderful feature of the virtual network, and I look forward to staying in touch with future events. And uh, can thank the uh, NGOs. <laughs> Facing the shadow monitoring, doing a similar briefing. And then uh, my second point is just to echo yourself, Chair, with your very first or second question, which is I think that an asset test for the um, uh, alliance and collaboration with the NGOs will be to get uh, a choice of indicators uh, as close as possible to those that were finally included uh, under the target and to see uh, what a um, monitoring dashboard might look like. The mosaic approach mentioned by Nathaniel is very attractive, but in regards to goal 16 and the whole SDG thrust is a bit of a pop-up. We've got to try um, and do our best. Thank you. Can you repeat your last two yes. sentences? Because I think that you know there's somebody else you know in the bridge that is uh, typing on the computer and that might be interfering with the with the with the connection. So I would I would want to ask you know the other person typing on the computer to please mute uh, for a second so Mark can repeat you know his last two sentences. Mark. Uh, yes. Uh, that is a uh, is a challenge of the bridge. Uh, we noticed the typing all along. Um, <laughs> now we hear an airplane. Sorry, okay, Mark. My last two sentences uh, were um, 
It's a perspective question on whether the mosaic's a cop out or not. I mean, I, I hear you. On the flip side, you know, the, I, all I would uh, all I would reflect on is the fact that there are goals and targets doesn't mean that those goals and targets are the right way to capture these very complex phenomena we're looking at. I, but I hear you on the practical level that we should as a community make a collective attempt to try and do our best given those constraints. I'm just saying that the constraints may not be ideal and thus we may not want to sort of skew all of our activity to fit you know, those imperfect constraints. So that's a lot of jargon, but I, I, think, I agree and acknowledge I'm also mindful of the longer term. You know, there are other important agendas beyond the SDGs that I think the Alliance cares about and many of us care about. Um, and in general, I think, you know, you're absolutely right, there'll be an interesting moment if we have the wherewithal to see with the once, especially post-expansion of the Alliance in the coming months, do we want to, separate from the shadow monitor, but sort of as an independent exercise, try and draw from all the databases the best possible mapping against the targets and just see where the gaps are. And I can guess right now where the gaps will be, but I think it's probably going to be half and half, or half we might have plausible proxies, and half we won't have anything good to say, and we won't have anything to offer in terms of a potential measure. But also, as you mentioned, you know, you know, in the beginning, uh, some countries will have more gaps than others. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Speak, right? some countries will be prone, you know, to have gaps in particular areas and particular issues, you know, that also might complicate, you know, the right right process. Um, you know, I think that you, you, you mentioned something along the lines of, you know, having some, you know, the importance of, you know, a, a, a narrative you know, report, right? It's not only about, you know, the statistical, hardcore, you know, data, you know, type of, of elements. And here is where, you know, the monitoring, you know, we need to go beyond, you know, 6.3, you know, number on a particular indicator, but what's that 6.3 means, yeah. right, in that particular uh, context. It's, it's, you know, it's important. The part of the discussion that, that we have here is, you know, can we try to think about, you know, you know UPR type of, you know, there's a very good review, which, you know, Reporting systems, right? the, you know, the country level, then the government, the civil society, that come together and say, okay, you know, this is what we understand by you know, 1646. You know, we know that we're affecting institutions in a very complex uh, process. But in my country, where I'm, I am today, or where the country is today, this is what it means. Right? And, you know, this is what it's working for. You know, what is, uh, I also think that you know the part of that, you know shadowing or independent reporting that can help push you know, the frontier you know, in, that, you know, in, those, uh, in those aspects when it comes to this monitoring to the reporting aspects. I think that for what it's worth, I would heartily second the idea of, I don't know what the right turn of phrase is, but sort of a multi-stakeholder discussion around some of these targets in particular. Some are more empirical and less contested, but others are yeah. just going to be really contextually specific and require a conversation more than a number, and maybe an argument, a bad argument. <laughs> I mean, what, like, what's the strength of Brazil's institutions right now? Which yeah. is, that's, a, like, that's a super rich, interesting conversation to be had, right? And you can come out wildly different on that. Um, I think that's <laughs> Either from very weak to, you know, to very strong, right? right? right exactly. And that's like a hugely complex conversation, but it's, you're not going to get a number that says it's four, it's seven, it's 12. And so I think that's right. I mean, there's maybe moments in here, and it won't be maybe part of the official sort of tracking progress, but 16 itself opens up interesting political space for very honest, interesting, you know, rich conversations around these agendas, which themselves could be more valuable than sort of the tracking of, you know, each individual target. We have uh, somebody that I believe is trying to intervene in Spanish, if I was uh, correctly, on the bridge. Any additional questions? No? Chris? I just wanted to um, pick something up. Great to have you on the line, Mark. And I just wanted to give a, a plug for the work that you've been doing, which I'm sure Nathaniel's aware of, on the, yeah. the Chassa 
uh, initiative, and particularly this um, desire to ensure that, that any kind of negative comments or reaction perhaps around experience and perception surveys um, is very quickly overcome in the context of Goal 16 because uh, some of the, the targets will be measured through those uh, methodologies and there is really good experience and Mark I know we're very familiar with what you do but just um, great to, to have you there and, and to know that you, know, you, you have the body of evidence emerging um, around some of those things which we I promote Sasha on a regular basis, seriously. And people say, what is that? Yeah. And then I have to take me five minutes each time to find the website. So there's some, some good communications on the team there. Because it is really pioneering. It's just it sort is. of buried. Yeah. You know, right? yeah. The more we can all do now, the better. Yeah. All right, on that note, right? Um, Daniel, thank you very much. Oh, thanks, thank everybody. For, you know, for uh, joining us. Coming right, to an extremely nerdy conversation. And Mark, you know, thank you for joining us. You know, from uh, the other side, I also understand that uh, we had Vietnam connected, uh, which is a uh, midnight. You know, and, and that's that's not coincidence, right? In Vietnam, you know, we were working on a very um, country-specific, you know, mm -hmm. survey-based uh, monitoring mechanism. Trying oh, that's to understand uh, uh, governance and public administration. So that's why it's a part of my question, right? In terms of you know how these data that must be able to you can be used as part of that um, system. Um, we had somebody from Latin America, uh, if I could understand correctly, you know, the Spanish uh, conversation, you know, that they were having, you know, on the on the uh, on the other side. Um, but um, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Really, thanks.